Great. Um, so the so the talk um, has a kind of um, has a title of the craftsman's drama, which I'll explain a little later. Um, it's very much not uh, a comprehensive overview of Letherby's work or his thinking by any means. Uh, quite the opposite, actually. It's a it's quite a specific study of uh, how his uh, design thinking developed through his um, years in practice, um, particularly focusing on his first and his last uh, buildings and um, kind of counterpointing his approach to design um, and drawing and site works uh, in those two buildings. So um, very broadly, uh, Lethaby's career kind of divides into three phases. Um, his first as a young architect, um, initially uh, an apprentice in the Midlands, um, but then for um, uh, 10 years or so from the age of 22 as the chief assistant in Norman Shaw's office. Um, and then he, uh, he left in his early 30s and established his own practice. Um, and this practice he ran for um, little over 10 years um, time and actually only produced six uh, completed buildings in that time, uh, one of which has been demolished. So there's only five buildings out there. Um, and then um, after the sixth one of these buildings, he uh, retired his practice and went into full-time education as a, um, a very significant teacher. And all the way through these second and third phases of his career, he was uh, writing extensively. And um, I'll kind of come on to that. So <clears throat> he left uh, Norman Shaw's office in uh, 1889 and very quickly started writing, uh, wrote a series of essays uh, in that immediate post-Shaw period, culminating in the book, The um, Architecture, Mysticism and Myth. And the thrust of his writing in these two years was um, to some extent trying to position himself as a young architect, uh, starting out in practice. And very much the, um, the thrust of that positioning was about this sense of architecture as idea, about the, um, trying to establish some sense of pure idea um, that architecture might respond to. Therefore, in, in this first uh, essay that he wrote in the AA Notes, he talks of the compromise between thought and its realization. And there's a, there's a kind of sense here that he follows on in Architecture, Mysticism and Myth, where he talks about um, the, um, the compromise between thought and its realization. He talks about it's only in story that we find ideal architecture, the pure thought unrelated to cost and utility. So um, in these kind of first couple of years of establishing a practice and establishing a position, um, there's some sense of um, looking for um, origins in architecture, looking for the ideal in architecture, um, and somehow, um, mere building, the, the kind of practicalities of realization are a, um, are a hindrance to this. So um, I'm going to start by talking about the first one of the bit of his building, first of the six buildings that he completed, which he produced um, uh, soon after leaving Shaw's office. It was actually a kind of hand-on job from Shaw um, who uh, the client, Lord Manners, had approached Shaw um, and Shaw had um, recommended Letherby and passed the job on to him. Um, it's a substantial house in, uh, on the edge of the New Forest, um, three stories, brick with stone detailing, uh, and here you're, we're approaching the entrance facade. Um, so here's the, here's the ground plan of it. It's, it's um, it's not, um, it's not spectacular in plan for its time. It's kind of relates quite closely to a number of houses that Shaw had produced around the same time. 
you see a certain symmetry in, in the main body of the plan and you enter this small entrance hall that takes you through to a, this long hall that passes all the way through from the front of the building to the back. Uh, and part of the intention of this is that you, you get these long views of the Solent in the distance and that in entering you kind of, you immediately get the full depth. And then through, and then kind of this, this sense of a um, arts and crafts house, um, kind of um, generally understood and identified by um, Theseus of, of, the, of the main rooms coming off that hall, the drawing room, the library, the dining room, uh, and then the staircase up to the family's bedrooms on the first floor and the servants' quarters on the uh, top floor. Um, and then um, there's a kind of long corridor that takes you through to the um, back of house servants area with the pantry and the kitchen. And then finally at the final um, end, there's a, there's a single story courtyard for the kitchens. Um, so actually, so we've entered, you enter uh, this side of the building and then the other side of the building faces onto the garden and uh, the distant um, landscape. So this is the uh, entrance hall. The entrance hall comes into this main hall here with a screen. This, uh, this table football here, this is because it's uh, been used for a number of years now as a, as a kind of young people's outward bound centre. Um, and this through hall with the large rooms coming off it. Oh. And um, uh, a number of notable fireplaces in the, in the house, particularly this one, this, um, they're all done by the Victorian firm Farmer and Brindley. This is, if you think that this is um, about 1891, there's some kind of Lucian quality to this flush um, detailing um, to the marble work. And the, um, on the outside, this is the entrance facade, which is remarkable in its complexity, really, in its compositional complexity, really. Um, so the, the symmetry that you see in the plan is only just evident um, in elevation. Um, and actually, each part of the facade has its own kind of almost symmetries. Um, so, for instance, that the um, the wing to the right where you enter through also is almost symmetrical, but then again not um, both around the chimney, but also on this half, not quite um, with the windows. Um, and actually, on the um, uh, there's he's he's producing his architecture, mysticism, and myth book at the same time as um, designing this. So you you see in the centerpiece. Of the um, of this single story roof here, you see this um, ideal um, temple form that he's uh, describing in the book and replicating here as the center of the universe. And then the garden facade is quite different. There's a lot more um, rhythm. It's very much about a play of um, counterpointing different rhythms. The rhythm of the um, um, the roofs. Uh, the bay, rhythm of the bays, the rhythm of the drainage, and then these kind of two um, stop marks at either end. A lot of um, a lot of compositional richness to the building. Um, and although he'd spent ten years with Shaw, um, and there's some evidence of Shaw's kind of influence in the in the plan of the building, um, it was about the same time as setting up that he met Philip Webb. He, um, he ended up uh, taking an office in um, Gray's Inn Square um, adjacent to Philip Webb and the two became very close friends and some of, something of a kind of mentor to him through his life. And um, this, this kind of meeting with Webb about the time of um, uh, starting this building or completing this building and having written uh, these texts, um, he, uh, he writes here, the happy chance of close intimacy with Philip Webb at last satisfied my mind about that mysterious thing that we call architecture. From him I learned 
that what I was going to mean by architecture was not designs, forms and grandeurs, but buildings, honest and human, with hearts in them. Um, so he, um, he becomes very close uh, with Philip Webb and uh, is certainly influenced architecturally. Uh, there's something of um, Webb's standen in the in that garden facade with the repeating uh, roof line um, but in particular he takes from Webb um, a sense of what architecture is about that architecture um, is about building and this is his first kind of reversal uh, of position that having kind of written these texts that uh, that kind of bemoan the the inherent uh, compromise of building he, he meets Webb and decides that this is all wrong. And in actual fact, um, uh, building isn't a compromise. Building is what architecture is all about. Um, and at the same time, he also adopts from Webb something of me Webb's uh, methodology. So Webb was um, famous for uh, drawing himself and drawing everything and meticulously describing through drawings a project. Um, and so, Letterby takes this on and the house has 229 drawings, um, many of them, well drawing sheets, many of them have multiple drawings within them uh, and they describe the uh, building, not just the kind of facades but also all of the construction in, in uh, exacting detail. Um, so this is some of the drawings, some kind of simple facades and facade studies but also he's completely involved in the um, construction detailing, the kind of the lead, the size of lapping that a lead might have, or um, this kind of chimney roof construction. And almost all of these are all produced by uh, Letherby himself. So for instance, this is a garden gate, and he's drawn every one of the fixings, and he's drawn the shape of the nail and describing exactly um, every element of this building in drawing before work started on site. Um, there's the bell at the top. And I found particularly interesting looking through these drawings, his, um, his studies of the drainage, where he is simultaneously solving construction problems, solving problems to do with falls and so on. But also he's kind of thinking about them compositionally as well. He's thinking about them as a, as a compositional element. Um, incredible, really, all these kind of, uh, this is all of these this current drawings I'm showing are, are on um, drainage, whether that's um, kind of uh, one to 50 or so kind of layouts or these kind of closer details of um, pieces. And that's very evident, like I say, in, in the building, whether it's this kind of compositional play of the relationship of the drainage to the masonry forms, um, which are kind of dance around the facades, or the kind of playfulness of it, um, again, in a kind of very compositional way, but a kind of playfulness that um, counterpoints the playfulness of the, of the uh, masonry. And this is the, um, this is above the entrance, this is a different part of construction here, you see here the two peacocks um, uh, sculpted in the top and these, uh, these relate to the manor's family crest and there's a detailed drawing here of them but then um, pointedly he draws the, um, the exact form of this, um, these peacocks. And he even kind of goes insofar as to make these notes on the drawing to the, um, to the craftsman who's going to make them, kind of describing a methodology to the craftsman. You note at the top, it says, note, first cut out the square, and then uh, the form shown by red line, and then take off the chamfers shown by black. So he's, he's got this sense of wanting to fully describe the building in drawings, um, but also almost not quite trusting the people who are going to make it. So he, even though he's not a mason himself, he wants to tell them how to do their job um, to some extent. And um, so he's kind of 
taken this methodology from Webb, but I think during this building, there's a kind of, he, he develops a growing unease with this methodology. Uh, and he, um, at one point, speaks to Webb and he asked Webb why William Morris gave up architecture. And Morris had, had replied to Webb because he, he, he found uh, he could not get into close contact with it. It had to be done at second hand. And this kind of sense that Morris had that, um, that uh, this kind of sense of frustration at architecture, but kind of being stuck at your drawing board away from where the real action was. Um, so following this, um, uh, Avon Terrell, he produced another four buildings and during this time he was writing a lot uh, and through those texts he was um, developing a new, uh, uh, his position and kind of changing his position. Um, very much now looking at craftsmanship um, but also there's a kind of developing sense of political awareness in his texts. So this is one of the first ones, lead work, old and ornamental and for the most part English. Um, uh, and I'm not going to go through all those texts, but one of the key ones is an uh, is extended essay he writes called The Builder's Art and the Craftsman, um, where he talks about the problem of the um, division of labour as being fundamental to architecture. And he says that the crafts of the mason, the carpenter, the plasterer, even now being finally destroyed by a system in which the designer has no hands to execute and the worker no head to think. Um, and he kind of counterpoints this with an idea of uh, architecture where the art of architecture is thus the coordination of several crafts in the achievement of right or beautiful building. And this is not only in the outer form and adornment, but in the very structure and anatomy. Architecture is the easy and expressive handling of materials in masterly experimental building. It's the craftsman's drama. So there's a certain... Um, sense uh, with this idea of the craftsman drama of a, of a kind of theatrical analogy or a kind of direct a directorial analogy that rather than um, rather than fully defining a building one might engage with craftsmen and have a slightly different relationship with them um, and he kind of in parallel with us in the same essay he kind of he, he, he starts um, this, uh, there's this kind of unease with drawing as a, uh, and the role of drawing in the process. So he, he writes here, if you ask an architectural carver or metal work or decorator, if he seriously likes his work, if he considers that beautiful, he's surprised and injured. That's not his business. Uh, he works for the orders of the architect and one likes one way and another likes another way. Or he shows you those fatal drawings, which throughout are the bane of our modern method for it is um, on these that we lavish our care. It is these that have to be made pretty enough to catch the un uninstructed eye and be approved. It is these which have already sapped our enthusiasm. And before work is actually begun, the architect is engaged on the next and the next. So, um, I mean, he's got, he's got a very engaging and distinctive writing style. And um, this, is, this is written only a, uh, a year or two after the completion of Avon Terrell, where he produced 229 drawings, uh, where he'd gone about completely describing the building through, through drawings prior to construction. And here he's talking about those fatal drawings um, and this idea that your enthusiasm is sapped before you even um, start the actual work. Um, so he produced a series of these texts during this period with a kind of growing political awareness. Um, uh, and his final uh, building that he completed, the sixth, um, the sixth one, which he started about 10 years after Avon Terrell, um, was a kind of culmination of his thinking to some extent. Um, and it's a church in Herefordshire. Um, it's an Anglican church. Uh, this is the kind of rough view of it. If I kind of quickly show you the plan, it's a, quite a simple plan with a with a porch, main aisle, the chancel, um, and uh, this is there's there's very much kind of backside that I'll show you away from the porch, um, and then the altar at the end. Um, so you 
uh, you approach through a gateway and there's a slight slope up to the church. The church is um, masonry with a thatched roof, but actually interestingly, the thatched roof sits on uh, concrete constructed uh, roof structure. And uh, all of its masonry apart from the tower above the um, entrance, slightly strangely, it's got these two towers, one over the entrance and one over the crossing. Um, so this is the um, timber tower over the entrance. This is the rear. Um, so this is kind of facing the, um, yeah, the, the back of the site. Um, And it's a it's a it's a it's a simple building, but it's also um, kind of quite disarming in a way. Um, to some extent, it fit, so it was completed in um, uh, around 1901-1902, and it's uh, to some extent it's it it's got a primitive quality, um, but it also feels in a certain way kind of proto-expressionist, or it's, it's got kind of certain sense of um, being um, apart from any particular style, but at the same time, it feels very old, uh, very old and sometimes modern, I think I would describe it as. Uh, and there's some kind of, um, there's some uh, remnant of the interest in symbolism, a myth, uh, but quite subtly placed for um, the church. And then as you go inside, um, it's got this remarkable aisle with this, uh, with these stone arches and the concrete roof construction has been whitewashed, but I'll show you later, you still see the evidence of the concrete. And as you approach, this is the light that comes in from the crossing uh, with these uh, kind of whitewashed stonework, the um, the red stone, red local stone of the arches, and then you see on the top right there the the whitewashed concrete. And in the altar adjacent to the altar, there's works by um, Morris and Co. Um, these are Burne Jones tapestries, um, either side. Um, and this is the this is the concrete work to the roof. Remember, this is nineteen. Um, and some of the some of the detailings, like I say, it's 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 partly primitive or possibly um, Byzantine, um, but also there's a there's a kind of modern sense to some of it, some of it as well. Um, so these. Um, these windows along the main body of the church have these have these quite kind of horizontal aspect to them and then these interesting kind of figure of eight columns structural columns within them and you and you also get there you see he's got this kind of the marks of the mason very very much uh left evident and enjoyed so um, he'd gone through this process between these two buildings. He'd gone through this process, this kind of um, reversal of position where he'd, he'd decided that, um, uh, that there was something problematic with describing a building fully in drawings. Um, and so he, in this building, he, he tried something very different. He, uh, he produced only 11 drawings for the building and um, I'm going to run through them uh, because they don't describe very much, to be honest. Um, so there are two drawings at 1 to 96. It's Imperial, which uh, are this one, which shows the plan and the sections. The sections actually show a timber roof construction with a tiled roof, even though it's a concrete roof with that was built. Um, and the elevations, which also show um, tiled roof. A uh, heating drawing, that's the third one. A kind of detail of stone at the crossing. And this is a, this is a study piece actually, where he's exploring 
um, the two roof construction. So this is the only place where the concrete and the um, thatch are described on the right hand one where he's um, looking at this as a kind of possible alternative to the timber structure on the left. Um, but this is, it, it never got, um, the general arrangement drawings didn't get changed, didn't kind of work through in any way. Um, and then I think because the windows were made, were the only item made off site, they're the only bit that gets described in any, any greater detail. So um, there's a series of more detailed drawings that would have gone off site to a kind of mason's yard where the um, windows are described in some detail. And then the last one, this 11th one is a, a rough sketch. And it was accompanied, these 11 drawings were accompanied by a uh, specification. And the specification um, says the method of work, the whole of the work is to be done by day work under a clerk of works. So um, his idea is that rather than, um, rather than getting a main contractor and a um, fixed price, rather than a kind of comprehensive set of drawings. Actually, if he can uh, operate closely on site with a, with a site architect and uh, with a kind of uh, a general outline of the building in drawings, actually by working closely with the craftsmen on site, they could develop the design together um, and do this on a day work basis. Um, and so, um, some of the bits in the specification, they, so the concrete roof isn't described at all in drawings apart from that one study sketch. And then there's a little bit of kind of specification about the vaulting, um, which does talk a little bit about it. So, um, uh, actually, it's the same as the Lasden's National Theatre. It says the, the boarding to be first thoroughly wetted before it's, the concrete's poured. Um, and interestingly, uh, after those detailed drawings for Avon Terrell and his interest in uh, drainage and having written the book about lead work, none of the drawings show any um, gutters or downpipes. And the only piece in the specification is under the plumber section, it says um, form gutters on two sides and proper outlets. So this one kind of half sentence is how he describes the um, whole drainage system for this building um, until it's done on site. And um, so these kind of threadbed drawings, I'm not sure if you remember, but the, 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 the um, general arrangement drawings describe the masonry, uh, but they don't describe any of the timber work at all. So the, um, the pulpit, um, uh, the seating, and also the, um, the choir here are completely undescribed in any drawings whatsoever. Um, and he worked closely with a craftsman called um, Ian Jack, who uh, produced all of these on site. And these are these um, carvings in the choir stalls of local uh, wildflowers. Not, not, uh, there's nothing in the specification or the drawings uh, that mention any of this timber work at all. Um, and I thought I'd kind of home in on one part of one of the drawings. This is, um, this is the rear facade and this is the entrance to the tower at the left. You see here there's, there's no gutters, no downpipes, uh, the roof is tiled and this little low section with the door has a flat roof. Um, so when you visit the building, it doesn't quite look like that. Um, what happens is there's this kind of bulging form. I think when, when I looked into it, I think, what, I think what happened is when they did the drawing, they didn't understand the head height that was required to get up the staircase. So they drew this flat roof, but actually realized that they had to put a pitch on it. Um, so it kind of gains this sculptural quality that's all formed in lead. But also there's a kind of enjoyment to the uh, drainage, whether it's that roof there that forms the hopper and comes down and this here, that um, is compositional and yet not, uh, and very much enjoyable and part of the richness of the building, but not described at all. 
Um, so it's clearly something that was worked out on site. Um, so there's this sense of frustration that um, uh, Lethaby had with his earlier system, and he did this kind of complete reversal. And uh, it wasn't, uh, it was interesting, it wasn't all, to, it, the, the lessons from it are complex, I think. Um, so the, uh, so sorry, this quote, I should read this quote. So Webb was, before everything, a born craftsman, and might have been a great master builder or sculptor but he found himself imprisoned in an office with no other use for his hands with the unappreciated cunning and skill than to make heartbreaking attempts to convey his ideas of design and execution through the irritating medium of a lead pencil. Um, it's, uh, it's great, it's in, super interesting, this kind of uh, this arts and crafts um, simultaneous um, fantastic ability with drawing and with the pencil, and yet a frustration at the same time that kind of came from their sense that maybe actually that wasn't where the real action was. Um, and the two jobs, what happened with them, so the first one was done on a uh, standard contract with the main contract, actually the same contractor who Webb used for clouds. And uh, by all accounts, it went, uh, uh, it was delivered on time and on budget and the client was delighted. So to some extent, it was a success story. Um, the second, oh, sorry, the final project, or the second one I'm counting with pointing it against was uh, rather more problematic. Um, firstly, the, the client didn't completely buy into um, Lethaby's revised um, methodology, his kind of this experiment. Um, and um, also certain problems happened. He had a, he had a, I wonder if that's right. He had a, um, in order to make this work, he had to have someone on site. He was visiting site, but he had to have someone on site permanently. And he had a young architect called um, Randall Wells, who was 24 years old at the time, very young, and went on to establish his own practice. Um, but certain problems happened on site. There were technical problems, um, and there were changes. And I think to some extent, Randall Wells was maybe entering the experimental spirit of the endeavor, um, changing things and so on, but um, not always to great success. And at one point, uh, most notably, there were some uh, cracks formed in some of the walls and there was a certain sense of alarm that maybe they hadn't got the foundations right. So they got a specialist in and they, they put extra concrete kind of underpinning um, and the client was very uh, frustrated with the whole process. Um, Lethaby had a sense of remorse and um, ended up um, paying for the remedial works, uh, refusing his fee. Um, and uh, finally, um, through a kind of sense of debilitation through the whole process, um, gave up practice and went into full-time teaching and writing. Uh, which he did for um, the next 30 years or so. And um, so uh, it's interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a, there's a certain tragedy to the, to the, um, to the story of the project, um, but not altogether in that it's, it is a remarkable building. And despite these problems, there's a richness to the architecture that's not unrelated to that sense of... Um, engaged craft that you see at every turn. So, um, so I think, I mean, hopefully, hopefully that that's kind of clear, that sense of these kind of, um, these kind of reversals of position that Lethaby's had, and this kind of contrast between the two projects where, where Avon Terrell, he's trying to fix things before construction, he's got sole authorship, and the sole authorship is kind of creates a, 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 a building that's formed at the drawing board. It's kind of, it's, it's a building of the drawing board. It's, um, it's solely his, but it's very much kind of compositional as a result. And um, it's kind of all saints where he, he very loosely defines it before getting on site. And then 
partly, and then he kind of engages the craftsman as a kind of completely integral part of the um, process of designing. And to some extent that's based on a, um, a kind of Ruskinian um, sense of artistry that the building will be better and more alive through the um, sense of engaged workmen but also a kind of sense of a kind of political engagement as well that he's kind of got through William Morris of trying to give the craftsman agency. So maybe I'll stop there now. I'm not quite sure how long I've gone on for, um, but I could hand over to Trevor if we've got him. Okay, I'm happy with that. I'll be very brief, as quick as I can. So shall I start? Please. I think first of all, he did a really good job of um, going through in great detail the documentation of those two buildings and it actually added a, a great, much clearer light on Letherby's journey from um, the idea of the architect, the idea of architecture being compromised by building to the craftsman's drama. I just want to talk very briefly about Mel Setter House where um, he did some experiments along the way towards the Brockhampton project. Um, why Mel Setter? Well, first of all, um, he used the small chapel at Mel Setter as the first experiment he did with concrete. But also because um, Mel Setter House is in the Orkney Islands and the Orkney Islands are a long, long way away. Even today, it takes uh, more than a day to get there by train and ferry, as Lethemy would have done. So he probably would have had to lean on local knowledge, the sandstone, the harling, which is what they call render in, in Scotland, where they throw, they render at the wall so it sticks better. Um, he visited Orkney only once before the project in 1897. Um, um, the drawings are dated April 1898. Um, and he, in May, there were 19 labourers on the site, probably demolishing some of the old steading that became the footprint of the bases of the new house. It's a great big country house, by the way, on the, the island of Hoy, if you don't know the house. Uh, in June, there were 11 labourers and nine masons and two hewers. Um, the quarry, the stone was quarried about a quarter of a mile south of the house on the edge of the Pentland Firth, so very much a, a local kind of building from the earth, as it were. It was completed, completed in 1899, but the main thing I think in to do with um, Hughes, part of his uh, story is the chapel, which was begun at this same time, 1899, and it was his first experiment with concrete. Um, work on the chapel, as I say, began as the house was being finished in 1899. It's a very small building, 50 foot long, 15 meters, sandstone walls, three foot thick, up to about shoulder height. And then there's a very steep pitching curved concrete roof, which is cast in the form of an upturned boat. So I think in this very first, it's a smaller building, so it's got none of these supporting um, stone arches that we see at Brockhampton. But I think here we see Lethaby trying to introduce his symbolism that's so interested in him. Um, obviously our word nave for the church, the body of the church, comes from the Latin navis, which means a ship. And in the early Christian era, era um, the Christians being persecuted by the Romans looked to the church as a kind of ship of salvation. So Lethaby is working with a kind of a ongoing symbolism, if you like. He carved a, had a bell tower on the east end of the chapel, which is carved again in a section through the um, upturned hull of a boat, and um, with a keel as well, just to make sure you see the point. In June, there were 2,600 slates, Caithness slates delivered, and in September, two tons of cinders, which is the aggregate for the concrete. So I think in this very small building, um, which I can't really show you, but you can get a picture of maybe, you can look up my book on Melted House. Um, he realized in a modest way, his ambitions of trying, trying to reconcile this kind of new technology coming in concrete with his kind of idea of the crafts. He came later on to formulate his position on architecture as an ever-developing structural art, but a place remaining for the hand. In his own words, some residue for individual souls to care for. But one thing of interest came out in 1896, when I was asked to be the architect for the restoration of the chapel, which had become very damp through penetration, and the skews, which are what they call coping stones in Scotland with spalling. 
stone, I thought. Well, I know nothing about stone. As an architect, I don't work with stone. So what did I do? I followed something in the footsteps of Lethaby. I went along, in this case, to the mason at Kirkwall Cathedral, uh, who taught me, who um, ordered the stone for me, told me what stone to get and ordered it. And then he came along to instruct the um, builders I had, who were basically kind of learning boys, really. One was the um, English literature student who'd um, dropped out to Hoy. And um, Historic Scotland, of course, were involved, as this was a grade one listed building. And they asked in their specification to have lead flashings and soakers put underneath the um, coping stones, the skews, when these were replaced. Now, when the builder started to do this, stripping off the slates, a problem emerged. And I had a dramatic phone call saying the slates were splitting. So I was able to catch a plane up to Orkney the next day. And what we found very, very interestingly, the slates were being nailed directly into the concrete. I've never heard of that before. I don't know what he was doing, but the fact that he was building this in September, it's quite wet in Orkney that time of year and into October. So maybe the concrete remained green for quite a long time so he could do this. Now just two minutes, just to kind of um, contextualise Lethaby a little bit on the architectural scene more generally in the 90s. And this is what really interests me really, when he became this radical thinker. He burst on the scene in 1895 with some lectures which he called Modern Building Design at the Architectural Association. And in this lecture, he made the radical suggestion, controversial suggestion, of replacing the word architecture by the designation of rat rational building. Now this caused quite a stir. The lectures were reported in the Builder, which was the leading architectural journal of the day. The AR was only founded a year later. Um, there were critical editorials and letters including one critical one from Bannister Fletcher, the very same. Um, whereas Lethaby um, was vehemently against styles and what he called features, Bannister Fletcher, obviously, and the others were arguing that was still part of architecture. About the same time, Lethaby became involved in establishing the Central School of Art and Crafts, and then soon after he became the first principal. It established a new form of teaching, Craftsmen, artists, and architects worked with students in purpose built workshops. At about the same time, again, the German Hermann Mutatius was sent by his government to report on English design and manufacture. And Lethaby was almost certainly his guide because he singled out the Central School as being the best school of design he had ever seen. And when he came to write his book, Das Englische Haus, um, when it came to talking about arts and crafts architecture and arts and crafts in general, the first mention he gave was to William Lethaby. And as you know, shortly after this, Mutatius went back to Germany, founded the Werkbund, which was the forerunner of the Bauhaus, and there we know engineers replaced or helped craftsmen in setting up workshop teaching. But Lethaby lived, as my very last point, Lethaby lived uh, long enough to comment on Le Corbusier, and his famous maxim, the house is a machine for living in. He said, yes, I'll go along with that, Mr. Lethaby, but let's emphasize the living in rather than the machine. And I think for me, this is what um, sums up the arts and crafts movement at its very best. I see it as a late offshoot of the romantic movement, where Wordsworth and Coleridge in the lyrical ballads thought to revitalize poetry by looking at the speech of men working close to nature like Shepherd and Plowman, Lethaby and the Art and Crafts thought that by looking at building crafts, men working close to materials drawn from the earth, then um, that would revitalize architecture. It was the beginning perhaps, but it was a necessary beginning. Lethaby called architecture following Browning in poetry as romance in the real. And as you probably heard um, you allude to, Webb talked about architecture as a folk art, folk art ballad building folk instinct bubbling up from deep natural wells. So I think um, you know, we may not be able to return to the craftsman in our work. We can perhaps specify materials and help the workmen develop a feel for materials. But as Richard Senator said, perhaps we as designers should try to think more like the craftsman. That's all I think I've got time to say. Probably is all I need to say. Philip, uh, uh, Philip it's um, a question from Phil Christie. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Hi, yeah. yes. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yeah, hello. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, um, both of you, for, for your talks. Um, very, very inspiring, really. Um, um, I, I'm just reminded um, of, you know, this diff the, the change that you show from a, the beginning of the career to the end of the career of um, um, a highly well-drawn, um, very, very carefully drawn and carefully designed project to one where he tried to, um, as I understand from what you said, tried to work on site with the craftsman and make decisions on site and not draw so much on the paper. Um, reminds me of, um, I, I think of it a kind of an, an, an analogy of um, Sigurd Leverance's work from the beginning of his career. Um, for example, the Chapel of Resurrection, which is you know, this exquisite neoclassical building that is um, per, um, very, very carefully drawn and following um, you know, the, in the footsteps of Schinkel or something like that. And, um, and the later career works such as the chapel of uh, the church in St. Peter's in Klippan, where we see Leverance, you know, on site every day and um, deciding on, I suppose, deciding on tile work and, and brick patterns and so on um, with the craftsman day to day. Would you say that's a, a rel relatively good analogy? Um, me or me or who? Yes. <clears throat> um, yes, I mean, I, um, I suppose in, I suppose with the um, Leverance case, I know the, I know the project more outline and the kind of his methodology, methodologies rather more, um, I'm not, I'm not completely clear on them, but, uh, to the same degree, uh, but certainly that's that's how one understands the two processes, and it does seem like quite analogous. I suppose. I suppose what one of the things that's interesting about um, um, Lethaby is this is his um, transformation from one uh, position to another happened in quite a small time in this kind of ten years period. But also he 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 documents it very clearly. He writes constantly between the two uh, projects. And his, it's through these texts that you can see his kind of reversal of position and the and the kind of reasoning for it. And I suppose um, that's one difference with Leverance, who who didn't have that kind of written output, and so his his um, motives when you kind of have to um, there's a certain degree of guesswork. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I actually, I slight, I think I understood. Maybe I've got it wrong, but but Leverance. Kind of was on the building site during the day and then he went back to the office and drew in the evenings or have i maybe got that wrong yeah i think he did probably that's what they think that he did yeah, yeah. um um but i yeah he i, he, I understand in fact it, they say that he often went uh at night time or like after the workmen had left to check the site and um then went and sort of thought about a certain detail for the next morning yeah, I think certainly the feel of um, certainly the fe sorry, who's, who's coming up? I think certainly the feel of um, the Clippen Chapel in particular, where the, the brickwork is quite kind of rough and the brick not rough, but kind of the uh, the mortar joints are large, and the details of the kind of hinges and the woodwork on the um, various bits of joinery, you get a sense there of at least the materiality, and that in itself gives a sign, a clear sign of a craftsman at work. I think maybe you know. Um, the closer we've got, or the further we've got away from the arts and crafts, maybe that's something which we can try to keep in place in uh, in a contemporary architecture. So yes, I agree with that. Um, we've got a question from Roland Jeffrey. Roland, you've got the microphone. Um, thanks. Um, thank you both for your talks. I mean, those three buildings have got to be among my favourite in buildings in Britain. Um, I've got a question about Randall Wells, um, who you described, I think, um, as an architect um, at the church in Brockhampton. He's, he's normally referred to as a clerk of works, and my guess is that he was the person doing the clerk of works role that um, was described in the contract. Mm -hmm. You showed us the front page of the I suppose what we would call the prelims to a modern contract. 
Um, do you know anything about him? I mean, was he architecturally trained? Was he a clerk of works? Um, why was he so young? And why was he trusted with the foundations? <laughs> Um, if he was, it seems a bit unfair to blame him for what went wrong. I um, I do know a bit about him. I don't know all of the things you uh, suggest, but I do know some other things. At some point, someone's going to write a, um, possibly Ellis, is going to write a biography of him because he's he had quite a racy, quite a racy um, biography of um, going off with clients' wives and so on later on. Uh, <laughs> But um, I think what, what, uh, what I think was particularly noteworthy about his role is, um, you're absolutely right, he, he was kind of formally clerk of works. I suppose I kind of referred to him as site architect because um, I think there's some kind of blurring of roles there in the way that Letherby envisaged it. Um, I think one of the things that I thought was um, very noteworthy is that, um, he started his um, own career as an independent architect straight after this church. Um, and actually his first building was a couple of miles away and was a church um, which had certain similarities to Letherby's church. And actually the completion dates were very close. It was just afterwards. So um, I can't help thinking that, you know, at the age of 24, 25, this young architect is on site, living on site, and he gets this quite a large project to start his own practice up with. And he's juggling the design work for that while he's finishing the other one for Letherby on site. And um, uh, possibly it's too much for a young man to um, hold uh, onto. Um, and certainly the sense that maybe he wasn't completely uh, focused on Letterby's project is had kind of evidenced a little bit, I think, by the by the dates. So he was moonlighting. Yes. <laughs> um, Hugh, could you, as I said at the beginning, this uh, bit of research forms uh, the beginning of a kind of PhD that you're undertaking at the University of Oslo. Um, could you just say a little about, bit about the, the, the bigger picture that it fits into? Yeah, I suppose, um, uh, so I'm a practitioner and um, I am, I'm interested in architectural history for itself, but I'm also interested in it for the lessons it teaches, uh, it kind of gives me for my own practice. Um, and I think, I think my broader interest that this kind of touches into is, is, um, is about the relationship between designing and making or, or between project and building and that sense of uh, distance between, between the two that um, is kind of prevalent. Um, and I'm kind of interested in how one might counter that. And so, so how I might counter that or a contemporary practitioner might counter that in their own practice and somehow kind of um, get closer to um, get closer to the site, get closer to site works and somehow how how I might go about um, uh, developing my practice so that um, the design isn't fixed but there's some kind of engagement throughout the process and very much throughout that kind of site works that it's a kind of um, it's an ongoing living process. And I think he's a he's a kind of great example, or this kind of story of this of this kind of switch in positions is a great example of someone who's um, who's uncomfortable with that um, division and has kind of very obviously trying to challenge it. <laughs> 